Introducing Grounded Theory. Hi, I'm Sheldon Larson, and today I hope to provide a simplified overview of Grounded Theory, a research methodology. Just a quick joke to get us started. Why couldn't the research theory go out with its friends? Because it was grounded. Okay, I promise no more. First, we'll, we'll discuss what defines grounded theoretical research. Then we look into the history and background of the theory, including three different models of grounded theory that have emerged over the years. While this theory has many benefits, there are also some concerns to consider when deciding what method of research to pursue. Finally, we'll discuss some examples of grounded theory being used in research. Unlike other research methods, the theory is developed after an exhausted data collection process, making the theory grounded in data. Grounded theory is useful for beginner researchers as it provides a step-by-step, -step, systematic, qualitative process. And it's used to study social issues or phenomenon such as a process, action, or interaction. At the end of this presentation, I will share some examples of grounded theory. You might be asking what exactly is grounded theory and what makes it so unique? Grounded theory is different than other methods due to its unusual way of leaving the development of the theory to the end. It's almost like going for firsts, seconds, thirds, and fourths at a meal before finally getting to the dessert. The steps or procedures for grounded theory are shown here. The first step is to decide if grounded theory is the best fit for the, fo for the social phenomenon to be researched. Next, the researcher needs to identify a process or action to study, followed by step three, which involves getting approval for the research process. The fourth step is conducting the interviews and other methods of theoretical sampling. While data is being collected, the researcher must code the data in step five. After a continuous cycle of data collection, coding, and categorizing narrows, step six, selective coding and the development of theory is done. Step seven involves validating the theory through literature reviews to ensure that the theory is sound. And finally, in step eight, the researcher writes their report on their findings. While we'll learn about some different types of grounded theory, there are six key characteristics required to meet the definition of grounded theory. First, the need for a specific process of discovery was emphasized by pioneers of the method, Glazer and Strauss, which we'll get to. The level of adherence to the process would later be a source of contention for the two sociologists. Grounded theorists collect data that they feel will be useful in generating a theory and begin deciphering it right away through something called emerging design so as to find direction for their next data collection rather than waiting until all the data is in. The researcher is constantly going through a cycle of comparing incidents and data through the development of categories and the use of indicators and a coding language. Once major categories are developed from the data, a core category is identified based on a number of factors from other process categories and its ability to identify a theory. Only after saturation of data collection and core category identification can a theory be generated according to grounded theorists. The theory is an abstract explanation or understanding of an important substantive topic based on the data from multiple individual resources. Memos are used throughout the entire process as a way of research researcher making notes about the data, such as hunches, ideas, or thoughts they might have. These help to guide the data collection and categorization process. Origins of grounded theory. Some history and background of grounded theory is necessary to fully understand the transformation and expansion of the method. Grounded theory, as mentioned before, was developed by two sociologists in the late 1960s, Barney G. Glazer and Anselm L. Strauss. They studied terminal ill patients and published their research methods, which then led to them writing their groundbreaking book, The Discovery of Grounded Theory, published in 1967. 
This method was the reverse of typical research methods using scientific method. Rather than developing a theory and then trying to prove it through research, they felt that data collection sh should come first, based on broad search topics, then a gradual narrowing towards a theory through a cyclical process. However, late in their career, Glazer and Strauss had a falling out over Strauss's new work in 1990 and 1998 with Juliet Corbin, which proposed some revisions to the original design that according to Strauss overemphasized the rules and procedures of grounded theory. This is known as systematic design, and it's the first of three designs we'll talk about. Systematic design came under fire from Glazer for being too rigid and focused on the coding and categorization process. This method uses preset categories and is focused on describing the categories through an open, axial, and selective coding process. Glazer's emergent design is less rigid in its process than the systematic design and works in a constant cycle of examining and comparing data and refining. Categories are developed from the data, which then work towards the development of the theory. A third design is the constructivist design, based on Kathy Sharmaz's work in 1990, 2000, and 2006. It uses active coding to describe experiences, thoughts, and feelings of individuals. This less formal, more interpretive research is more abstract, with conclusions being suggestive, inconclusive, or incomplete. Pros and cons of grounded theory. There are some definite reasons that researchers would choose to use grounded theory methodology in their studies, but there are also some drawbacks to consider as well. Some advantages. Theory is created from the data. One of the greatest advantages of grounded theory is that the theory is authenticated by being grounded in the data. Due to the cyclical nature of constant reflection and revision, grounded theory allows the researcher to adapt to new revelations and directions that the data takes the research. Because of the constant revisions and narrowing towards a theory, research data is quite in-depth. An accurate picture of what really is going on in the social phenomenon is produced due to the set organizational procedures that constitute grounded theory. There is a clear set of steps for researchers to follow throughout the process. And finally, a quality grounded theory study will usually include a visual model or diagram of the theory as a main centerpiece of the paper. For somebody like me that's a visual learner, it's really quite helpful. One major challenge to grounded theory is that the role of the researcher is one that is deeply involved through the data collection, such as interviews, coding, and interpretation of the data, this could call into question the subject subjectivity of the process. The broad, time-intensive, continual process of data collection, coding, categorizing, memo writing, cycle towards data saturation and theory development, researchers will be challenged to manage the amount of data. The researcher needs to be skillful in grounded theory methods in order to maintain integrity of the research and control of the data. Many researchers complain about the coding language being difficult to understand and can come across it to many as jargon. This may lead to many researchers getting frustrated or intimidated to use grounded theory. The development of different designs of the method, like systematic, emergent, and the more recent constructivist, can make it difficult for new researchers to keep track of the differences in the designs. Practical applications. Now we'll cover a couple of examples of grounded theory. The first example I found using grounded theory methodology is about the dangers of adolescents using social network platforms in the perspective of gender differences. And it's titled, how do adolescents use social networks and what are their potential dangers? A Qualitative Study of Gender Differences by De Felice et al. The study involved focus groups of 296 male and female Italian adolescents. Researchers used a cyclical, systematic design model of using 
open, axial, and selective coding of the data categorization and memos until the saturation of the data was achieved. The report includes two diagrams central to the theory, a hallmark of grounded theory methodology. The first diagram clearly shows the findings central to the study that show a distinct difference between male and female uses of social networks. The second diagram highlights the riskiest uses of social networks and how they reinforce each other. In spite of the dangers of social networks, the study notes the key role they play in modern society and the importance of users being educated in safe use practices in order to access the positive benefits that social networks can provide. A second example of grounded theory is an article written by Robert Thornburg in 2018, School Bullying and Fitting into the Peer Landscape, a Grounded Theory Field Study. In his study on school bullying, Thornburg conducted a study on three primary public schools in Sweden. The study found that when bullies are viewed based on personal characteristics, or who they are, that a variety of other key oppressionistic factors like racism, genderism, heteronormativity may be ignored. In other words, students may be acting out due to the pressure to fit in to the peer accepted view of normal. He suggests that until anti-bullying work through political and social reforms and interventions take place, nothing will change. Thornburg notes that the fieldwork and analysis were guided by Sharmaz's constructivist grounded theory method, constantly moving between data collection and analysis guided by theoretical sampling. He developed codes by constantly comparing data with data, data with codes and codes with codes, and eventually began to conduct theoretical coding. I found it interesting how clear the subjectivity of grounded theory was addressed by Thornburg in the conclusion, stating that his findings were not exact in nature but were an interpretive portrayal of school bullying as true to the two grounded theory principles. While I found it to be a really thought provoking article, it did not include a visual model of the theory, but did explain the research method extremely well. Some final thoughts. Grounded theory methodology has many applications for educational research, addressing social issues or phenomena. The process can be quite involved but I do like the fact that research begins without a specific theory in mind and that the theory is developed based on the data. I would definitely consider using this method for educational research.